Hey hey people, Seth here. Today, I'll be playing the predecessor to one of the best turn-based strategy games of all time. A game where combat is decided by whoever gets to move first, victory is decided by who gets the most broken spells, and where the best day of a week is Monday. I'm speaking, of course, about Heroes of Might and Magic 2, but really, it should just be called Heroes of Magic and sometimes Might if you're very unlucky. I played this first as a child, and now I return to it as a man-child. Released in 1996 by New World Computing, we're going to be looking at this game as the original building blocks for Heroes 3, which got everything right. In contrast, Heroes 2 gets everything wrong, but it's got a lot of soul, it's very pretty, and it's generally a very relaxing experience. First, let's cover the lore. The story takes place after the dominant monarchy has a little disagreement. Roland Ironfist is the rightful successor to the throne, but Archibald Iron Fist has had enough of his faggot brother, so he accuses him of soiling the bed and forces him to flee the kingdom in embarrassment. In the campaign, you can choose to either stand with Roland Iron Fist and defend his right to shit the bed, or choose to represent Archibald in his rightful condemnation of his brother's scatological tendencies. Canonically, Roland wins and turns his brother to stone, which is used as a plot point in the RPG games, since Archibald is the only person who understands nuclear physics. I'm not joking, I'm completely serious. You need to free him in Might and Magic 6 unless you want the planet to explode in a thermonuclear blast. The Archibald campaign is pretty challenging. The Roland campaign is a billion times worse. There's only one way to win. It's a complex strategy that I like to call restarting the mission until you get lucky and get a spell that lets you no-clip across the map. I think that statement alone should give you a hint of what Heroes 2 is all about. Out. I got the good old games copy, which emulates the game to run on Windows 10. There's some glitches, but these can all be fixed by playing around with the configuration. Generally, everything looks, plays, and sounds great. This was the first Might and Magic game where they went all out with their sound design. Everything is beautifully composed, and I should mention, every single town theme is sung by a fucking professional opera singer. Have a listen. The production values in this game are absolutely top-notch. Just look at how insanely pretty everything is. Every single unit, every single set piece, even the resources you pick up, gemstones, crystal, treasure chests, they're all still crispy clean to this very day. To illustrate my point, here's a basic unit dwelling for the Knight Faction. It's a structure responsible for spawning the most useless unit in the game, the Peasant. And it still looks better than any place I've ever lived in. This detached two-bedroom cottage probably costs more than the student loans of several millennials combined. They told me medieval peasants had it bad. I'm sorry, how can they have it bad when they've clearly got a front garden and, supposedly, a clean source of drinking water? There's a very saturated, high-contrast color palette in this game, and as a kid, I took all that quality for granted, because the modern Heroes games now look like someone's shitty deviant art page. I'm going on tangents now, which is a growing symptom of my impending dementia. So, let's get to the gameplay. Heroes 2 is a turn-based strategy game, which means it's for thinking people, and people who are too slow to play StarCraft instead. The principle is very simple. You recruit heroes to lead your armies. These all have different stats and skills respective to their faction. The portraits for heroes are an absolute acid trip. There's almost no way to tell what class they are until you mouse over them. Let's take this guy, for example. Can you guess what he is? Yeah, that's right. He's a knight, which means he's a good guy. And on Roland's side. Okay, let, let, let's, let's try that again. Can you guess what this guy does? Yeah, correct. He's a wizard, which means he's also a good guy on Roland's side. You know, I'm really starting to doubt 
Roland's motives. Half of his team look like they've just come out from serving prison sentences for aggravated rape. But who am I to question royalty? A lot of the sorceresses make for great waifu material, though. Ah, the 90s. Back before women became degenerate and started plastering their faces with septum piercings. Oh wait, oh no. You recruit armies by spending all your savings on dwellings that spit out new units at the start of each week. You also have to pay them up front. Each of the six factions has its own respective six-unit army, which range in tiers from level one to level six. However, your heroes can only hold five different stacks, so you'll have to pick and choose or mix and match to suit your strength strategy. Wizards are all about range. They've got three different shooters. Warlocks answer that by having three different flyers that can close the gap. Knights have no flyers, neither do the barbarians. Instead, the knights prefer to tank all the damage, while barbarians lack any kind of defense and rely on hitting fast and hitting hard. A sorceress is a mix of everything. A necromancer is a mix of everything undead. They get their ultimate unit quicker and cheaper than anyone else, and power liches are the only unit in the game, which can accidentally wipe out half of your own army. You've got a limited set of moves and actions you can take every turn. Once you're done with your turn, the computer moves around and pretends to be intelligent. Rinse and repeat. Research new spells, upgrade your dwellings, get higher level troops which aren't worth the money, and crush your enemies. It's all very simple. What's not simple is figuring out which factions aren't complete garbage. So, to save you the time, I've made a very easy chart. As you can see, of the six different towns you can choose, five of them are objectively hot garbage. That's because warlocks have the best unit in the game dragons. Some might argue that different factions have their own strengths and shine at different points in the game. Knights and barbarians in the early game, necromancers and sorceresses in the mid game, and warlocks and wizards in the late game. We call these people a Heroes 2 apologist. They are subversive, they are insidious, and they are fully convinced that a tier 6 unit with one quarter of the health and none of the perks of a dragon is a good financial investment. Also, they can't do this. If such a person approaches you, don't listen to their lies. Unplug their hearing aid and jam their mobility scooter immediately before they manage to convince anyone else at the retirement home. In Heroes 2, magic is king. Magic is essential for victory and completely overshadows anything an illiterate, brain-dead warrior can hope to achieve. Why? Because there's no counterplay. All a mage has to do is keep repeatedly suicide bombing his enemies to victory. What is the answer? to someone rushing at you repeatedly with phoenixes and spamming Armageddon. Losing. That's what. To beat magic, you have to counter magic with more magic. Armageddon spam can't hold up to a wizard with more spell points than white matter in his brain, who can just cross the entire length of the map with Dimension Door and take all of your towns in a single turn. Heroes 2 is a mess, but it's a beautiful, exploitable mess. In all due fairness, the idea of the game is that you're not meant to stick to a starting faction, and instead ramp your way up to getting the town you want, which is warlocks. If you can't get warlocks, eh, settle for wizards. Titans can still hold up to dragons, and boars make for a good source of fresh pork, I guess. If you can't get wizards, settle for uninstalling the game. Also, it should be mentioned that while everything works great on my good old games copy, the sound clip used for teleportation has been completely scuffed. How? Why? I don't know, but I think we should all experience it together. I know teleportation has its risks, but I never expected it to blow my eardrums. So if you have to teleport, please remove your headphones beforehand, or you're definitely going to develop tinnitus. Since we're on the subject of bullshit strategies, we might as well also cover bullshit units. Luckily, the developers had the foresight to realize that some of these might be a little too strong, so they're not available to any faction. Instead, they can only be obtained in limited numbers through diplomacy and bribery. Case example one, genies. These can only be found in magic lamps. They're very pretty. They also hit like a truck, but what my former child brain couldn't understand is that they've got a special ability. They can divide any stack in two, and it doesn't matter how many genies there are. One is enough. So split them up into stacks and go ham on your enemy's strongest unit. Hit a stack, get lucky, and your enemies just lost several weeks worth of income. And if you're playing multiplayer, you've just lost several 
several years worth of friendship. Case example 2. Ghosts. Remember how I mentioned peasants were completely useless? That's not entirely true. If you can somehow convince a couple of ghosts to join you, stop whatever it is you're doing and locate a small horde of peasants. Don't kill them. Let them grow. Let them ferment and let their population explode over the next few weeks. Then, it's time to harvest your crop. You see, ghosts take the numbers of any stack they've killed. And since peasants have a single hit point, you can sit back and watch your numbers swell from several dozen to several hundred to several thousand. In a single fight, you've turned a mediocre stack of units into the single most powerful unit in the entire game. At this point, nothing and no one can stop you. Your legion of ghosts will keep growing and growing until there's nothing left to consume. Their numbers will swell so high that the game just gives up trying to show you how many there are. When you've achieved and abused such high levels of broken design, you can finally call yourself a true strategic master of Heroes of Might and Magic 2. The game is still absolutely worth playing. It is dirt cheap on good old games, and in this day and age, even a potato clock can run the game. If you want a fair and balanced strategy game, don't play it. If you want to ambush leprechauns for their lunch money, redistribute wealth to the masses, only to murder the masses later, and cheese your way to victory, then this is the game for you. I give it three out of four genies, because I don't have the extra gemstone to hire the last one. Thoroughly recommended. Go play it. As always, more content to come, so stay tuned. A warm thanks to the many members of a Merchants Guild generously funding and bankrolling these videos. A huge thanks to one member of a guild in particular, since he somehow managed to get me a signed copy of a Heroes Live Orchestra CD and a nice HP keyboard, which he optimized for me in case I ever decide to play a league again. Thank you, fam. You're all truly wonderful. Have a good one. And now it's time to violate copyright. Enjoy.